and cover kind of the meanings and the deeper dimensions of what they mean. So beginning with the origins of Hebrew. Hebrew is the language of Elohim. Its um, first form was Paleo or Proto-Hebrew, um, also called Phoenician, and it's the oldest written phonetic language. The hieroglyphics, the Egyptian hieroglyphics are older, um, but this is the oldest written phonetic, meaning each letter has a specific sound that it represents. Um, that said, it appeared as a complete language, and that's one of the things that's really unique about Paleo-Hebrew. Um, it actually appeared with the mathematical and the, you know, kind of conceptual or pictographic meanings, um, as well as the phonetic meanings, all embedded together as one cohesive language. And that really points us back to what we call intelligent design, doesn't it? That this was not just something somebody really smart came up with. This was the product of the creator of heaven and earth giving a language to mankind in order to have begin a really um, facilitate a deeper relationship and, and the starting of the covenant. Because what's the first thing you need when you make a covenant with somebody? You need a written contract, right? That's kind of the definition of a covenant. So when he was ready, he had, he had already obviously initiated the covenant with Abraham, um, and he had had this relationship from the time of Adam. Um, but at the time of the giving of the Ten Commandments and the Torah, although we know from other parashat before that, that the, the Torah existed before that, that was the first time it was kind of codified and put into writing, and it was written by his hand on the stone tablets. And that's something a lot of people don't realize, is he actually, if you read the text, it says he engraved it with his own hand. So that's significant. I mean, we don't have anywhere else in recorded history where there's a language that was said to be engraved by the hand of a deity of any kind. And this is the creator of heaven and earth, the one and only creator of heaven and earth. So each character represents a concept, a sound, and a numeric value. And I've put the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet down there, but for some reason, my formatting, every time I put it in, it flips it around. I've still got to figure out, I've got the font now, but I've got to figure out why it's going left to right still instead of right to left. But you get the idea that um, these Paleo-Hebrew characters, and if you look here at the, on the left, and I want to credit that this came from ancienthebrew.org. I'm using, I've got two screens up and I'm using the wrong one here. Um, ancienthebrew.org, great resource for studying the Palo Hebrew. Um, Jeff Benner, great, great resource. Um, and I love this comparison he shows between the Phoenician, the Samaritan, and the Paleo Hebrew. So you can see how there was this progression. And it's not unlike our letter Bay, especially when you look at that Samaritan, which is really, I don't know why he put it in the middle. It really should be, I think, right of the Phoenician, but maybe he knows better than me on it. Um, so there was this progression, and of course it progressed to what we now have in the Tanakh, which is the Aramaic square script. And that's what we're going to primarily focus on learning, but I, as we learn that, I'm going to be teaching as well the Paleo-Hebrew um, characters alongside it. Questions before we move on? All right. So... The basics of the Hebrew language, and most of you guys know this, we read it from right to left, and there are 22 letters, they're all consonants, and today we're going to look at the two that are silent, the Aleph and the Ayun. And we say they're silent, but they're really not silent, they hold vowels, they are kind of these messenger letters, their whole job is to lift up and support the, the vowels, the Nikodot. Um, and in the earliest method, and the earliest forms of Hebrew, the, the, the matris lexionis were the actual vowels themselves. There were no nikidot. So um, in Hebrew, they're called amplia, same thing, mothers of reading. Is, uh, for those of you who have some Hebrew background, you see that root word kara, right, to call, to speak, um, the mothers of calling, the mothers of reading. Um, matris lexionis, of course, is uh, Latin. 
Um, and they were called that because they kind of supported and filled in the gaps in between these consonants. So there were four of them. There's the va, and sometimes they call it a wa. Um, Nehemia Gordon has a great teaching on how that comes from the modern Arabic influence, actually, rather than in ancient influence. But um, in any case, the va, the wa, however you call it. Um, and then we have the yod, the aleph, and the he. And I showed you here on the bottom here, the paleo or proto-Hebrew characters, as well as the square script. And you can see there's some pretty similar, you know, there's still similarities, even though they're pretty different. Yod being the most different, I would say. Um, and yet, you know, the yod, when we understand that, that means hand in Hebrew, yad is hand, and it also means or right arm. So it's both things at the same time. Oh, what would I do without my whole monitor? She came back. Welcome back, Jennifer. All right, so um, moving on. The um, meanings, and, and there's been some discussion in Little Team Jones about whether the meanings of the letters are gematria. And I want to emphasize, there are um, certain websites that take this gematria and Kabbalistic take on it and go all kind of crazy directions with it. That's not what we're learning here. The meanings of the letters are not any kind of secret code or anything, you know, um, they're, they're, they're not anything negative. They're just a deeper understanding of the letters themselves. Letters themselves in Hebrew, we call otot, right? That's the plural ot, which means a sign or a signal or an omen or an indicator. Um, so there are symbols and, and by understanding those meanings, it gives us a fuller picture and understanding of each letter. But these are not gematria, they're not mysticism. We're not gonna read things that aren't in the text. What's interesting when you look at the letters as they um, occur in the text, they all affirm, they serve as second witnesses, if you will, to the words they appear in. So there are direct relationships between the letters and the words they compose and construct. But um, we should never look at those to try to find some kind of meaning outside of what's there in the text. It's all just supporting what's already there in the text. So one way of understanding this is to think of these various interrelated meanings as pieces of a puzzle that put together and make up each letter. It's like we took the letter apart into pieces. Um, it doesn't, the engine and the carburetor and the different parts of a car, for example, to use another metaphor, um, don't give us some secret meaning into the truck. They just help us understand what the vehicle is and how it works and how it's put together and how it's built. So that's the way that I like to look at the meanings um, of the various letters. So the first letter we're going to talk about is the letter Aleph. And the pictographic meaning is the ox. And in the Paleo Hebrew, that's real clear. It's an ox head, right? Um, in the Aramaic square script, it's a little less clear that that's an ox head, but you can still see the horns. You can still see that kind of overall idea. Um, and Oken and the Aleph is silent, but it acts as a messenger letter carrying vowels, carrying those nikud or nikudot is the plural. Um, and so by looking at the Nikudot, that's there now, every once in a while, Aleph will function as a consonant, but by and large, it functions as a, I mean, it goes back to the grammar in the Mephra Sephionis, but um, by and large, it functions as a carrier for these different vowels. So I put together this little image so you can kind of see the Aleph in the center, the square script, and we have the pictographic meaning down there on one leg, and we have these different related meanings, strength. If we think about Aleph, Aleph is also the number echad, right? It's the number one in Hebrew. It has the numeric value of one. And by connotation, it also has this meaning of unity and oneness. And of course, it's the first letter in the word echad, which means one and also means unity. It talks about the man and the woman becoming one flesh, echad b'shav. And so um, it also has this connotation of chief, you know, the chief and the first things. Um, at the same time, it has, in, it, because of that relationship to the ox, it has that idea of strength and mightiness, which again relates back to this idea of being the first. Um, it's the first letter in the title Elohim. Um, it's in the word Eluf, which is champion or military leader. Um, it's in Otem, which is to seal or to authorize something. It's in the word Ish, the first man, right? Um, it's in the word Adam, the, the first man that was ever created, and mankind in general, who was placed as first and head and leader over all of the animals. So all of those meanings, again, are not any kind of secret gematria. They're just helping you understand the Aleph from a personal perspective. What is the Aleph? What is its function? 
um, and what does it do? And there's an interesting story as an anecdote um, that each of the, the letters were presenting themselves to Yehovah in the beginning of creation and, and the Aleph was, um, was not considered because the first letter in the Torah is a bait, right? That a sheet. And so the idea is that there was this humility and it's only in being humble that we can be put first. So to be put first, we must put ourselves last, right? And there's kind of a reflection of that. It's just a story. It's a folk story, you know, in Hebrew and Judaism, but it's a beautiful folk story of how the left kind of bowed out and said, look, I don't need to be first. And so the bait was placed first in the Torah. And as a result of that, the Most High turned around and said, you know what, you're going to be the first letter of the Aleph Bet, though. So kind of interesting. <laughs> All One right. more interesting fact is uh, the ox or the bull is the sign of Ephraim. And Ephraim is the royal house of Israel. That's a very good point. And, and the other interesting point to go back to that and the idea of strength and humility, um, there's also this concept of tameness, that the tameness and the domestication of cattle. Cattle were one of the first domesticated animals. Um, yep. And so if you've ever stood next to a cow, they're huge, they're massive, they're kind of scary, but there's this gentleness as well. Um, we have Brahma bulls here in Belize, Brahma cattle, and they're really big. I mean, they're extra big. And sometimes just to stand, just their nose is like massive. It's like this big, it's like bigger than your head, you know? So, um, but they're, they're a beautiful animal. So well, the I, idea raise, I raise cattle. And the one thing is, if you uh, gild a, a cow, a uh, bull, they become a very strong work animal for plowing, for pulling wagons, for doing heavy work. I mean, horses are great, and I have draft horses, but you take a full on ox and you take draft horses, and those oxen can outwork a draft horse. They're not fast, but they are strong. Man. Amen. That's right. They've got that slow and steady thing going on. They're definitely very strong, very strong. And they, and they really have a beautiful nature. You know, we think of bulls as really scary and bullfighting, but you really have to kind of push them to that point, um, unless they're protecting their, their cows, their herd. So the next letter we're going to look at is Ayin. And Ayin is the other silent um, letter that carries vowels. Um, in Paleo Hebrew, you can see it's quite clearly an I pretty cut and dry there. Um, and again, as well in the Proto-Hebrew, um, the second text I have down there is from the Isaiah scroll. It started to look more like the Aramaic script, but in both of those, you can still see this idea if you kind of turn it sideways of an eye, you know, opening. Um, so it's got this concept of sight, of vision, of revelation. And interestingly, it relates to the concept of salvation. And of course, we know the last letter in Yeshua's name was Ayin, right? So um, that idea of revelation, of experience, of salvation, of sight, of vision, of, you know, really understanding something from a, a deeper level is all there embedded in the Ayin. So when you see that, I want you to think of that whole picture. We have the word Ayin. We have Ait. We have the eagle, which is known for having tremendous eyesight. Um, we have the word Azeal, which is help or deliverance or salvation. Um, we have uh, Ayun, and that's the idea of studying or deeply study. There's Lelemod, which is to learn something. And then there's this deeper concept of really studying and getting down to the understanding of what it means. Um, in that, in that, all of these words start again with ayin. You can see them over there to the right as I'm reading them. Um, and we have itza, which is counsel. Right, comes from the idea to give advice or to give deeper understanding, to give a you know deeper picture of something. And then the last one is ilul, which is a genius, uh, somebody who's really, really intelligent. Um, they have a lot of understanding. They have a depth of understanding. They see clearly things um, on levels that others may not see them. Questions or comments about that one? All right, moving on. Um, so those are the slides that we have. And I want to talk now. Let me stop my share so we can just go back into the classroom. Um, if everybody can open up their cameras, if they're interested and willing. Um, I want to talk 
about the the bigger goals that each of you guys have. I know a lot of you guys are familiar faces, and uh, I'm really excited to to show you, you know, how we've combined my material and my method with Dr. Jones's method and accelerated learning method. Um, but I want to hear from each of you. So, what are your goals in taking this course, Anna? I want to be able to read without somebody holding on to my little trike bike and without the training wheels. <laughs> and, amen. Amen. And the thing that's going to help you the most in that, Anna, and this was something that Dr. Jones, when we were talking about and combining our course, he said, well, I notice in all of your lessons, you go through the, you use Bible Hub, which is a great you know, resource. He's like, but it has the transliterations there. He's like, that's giving people an unnecessary crutch, which you think is helping them, but it's actually holding them back because it's only really by jumping into the pool and having just the Hebrew in front of us that we can really challenge ourselves to be able to read fluently. And I know for myself, you know, doing this translation work, when I first started with no Nikudo and like trying to read with no Nikudo at all, I was like, oh. and now I can read pretty, pretty well. I still have to look, you know, at a letter, at a word, especially if it's unfamiliar and work it out kind of what, what we, we got going on there. Um, especially the vav can be because it can be o and u and it can be the v sound as well. Um, but it is it's so what's going to help you the most is actually that color coded Hebrew primer. And here in a minute, I'll open that up and show you what that looks like. And you can find it there on the course. You can before you print anything out, you can look at it right online. And it's color coded. So what I've done is I've color coded all the shorash those root words. And what I want you to do is when you see a word break it down and try to find that three letter root. And so I've done that for you in that, in the lessons we'll go through together in this course. But by the end of the course, I want you to be able to look at, and you've done, I'm sure in the researching work, sometimes you have to shave off those affixes and shave off those suffixes to figure out what is the root of this word and what does it mean? So that's gonna be a big help to you guys. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so I'm so blessed to see you here, Rocky. Thank you so much for being part of this. You guys are my A team. You guys, all of you guys are like just so dedicated and such a heart for this work. Thank you. And Kim, welcome. Um, Kim apparently has been working with Stephanie, and I had no idea. She emailed me and she's like, wait, I thought this course was free for Benaya and Up. I was like, oh, it is. I didn't know you. I have never met you. I didn't know. So thank you, Kim, for, for everything you're contributing. Are you there with us? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome, okay. Welcome. I just, yeah, I don't see my picture up or anything, but I'm glad you can hear me. <laughs> I don't see you. Yeah, your camera is turned off, it looks like, but you're unmuted. You start, what'd I do? Press, press that? The video. Um, yeah. Hey. 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 I can't. I'm not very tech savvy, I tell you. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. We're all learning as Any we go. Any you went to sleep. Yeah, there's Eugene. I knew he wouldn't shine. I'm here. You want him? <laughs> awesome. The but whole. We can't okay, hear him for okay, I'm going to do something fun. Wait, leave your cameras on. I think you can't out hear you, Gene. Gene's trying to talk, but we can't hear him. Muted, Gene. Oh, What's up, D? Muted, Gene. He can't hear when he's talking. No, he's not muted. Yeah, he is muted. Ah, I was muted. I'm sorry. I'm a dodo. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> on my property on the back roads in the dirt. So I had my camera off, but I can drive out here because there's no other traffic but me. <laughs> <laughs> Looks I'm like a rough road. There's this great function that this had. Where in the world was it? There's a way that you can put you guys all in little chairs in the classroom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do that in other meetings. Like, That's cool. I can't find it now. I found it last night when I was playing with and doing my test functions, and now I can't find it. I'm going to figure it out, though, because I thought that was super cool. Oh, it might be in the backgrounds, maybe. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then know. we can all see when a hand goes up, it goes up over the chair. And so That's everybody right hands are up that's cool that's right but now i don't see where it is it was like in some kind of advanced background or something i think maybe it was on here Let me see. that'll be your homework that's my homework i'm gonna figure out what i did and write it down in a notebook so i can i mean that's the only thing i can do to figure out all this stuff is like look at you know 
look at what I'm doing. And I wrote it down before this class how to do it to get the sound right. And I still did it wrong because then I was trying to share that YouTube video. So anyway, little by little. All right. Well, um, any other questions or comments or insights? Well, well, to answer your earlier thing, I'm here because I'm very dyslexic. And learning math and learning languages is my great downfall. When I study, you know, everybody admires my knowledge in scriptures, but I have spent 40 years reading them daily. And when I learn something, it takes me longer than a normal person. But when I get it, I've got it better than anybody else. And so uh, I found, Andrea, that you kind of think like I do. So I'm hoping that you can help me overcome and do this because... I'm so busy, it's hard for me to learn, but also with my learning disability. And I admire all of you, how you're going about and reading and uh, translating scriptures. And I want to be more a part of that. So that's why I'm here, just so you know. <laughs> I love you guys. Love we are so too. glad to have you, Eugene. You do, you contribute so much to the translation meetings. And I really look forward to helping build on that. Amen. I just wanted to say toda raba. Thank you very much, Aja, for providing this extensive study. Amen. 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 For taking it to the next level. Can we get yes. Well, I am so excited with all the tools that we have on that on that Learn World portal. I mean, there's just like a scratch the surface. Um, like I said, there is a, a quiz, and I think I, I realize now I didn't publish it because I wasn't quite done with it. But there'll be an online quiz that you can do at the end to kind of self-check so I don't have to check your homework. Um, mishpocha. Uh, mishpocha is, um, in you, both pronunciations are correct, Anna. Um, mishpacha is Hebrew. Mishpocha is how they say it in Arabic. Um, and it was actually interesting because I met at the Jaffa Gate when I was in Jerusalem. One of my favorite people of all time that I met in the entire country was this wonderful Arabic man, Zaki. And he sold this, what they call this Jerusalem bagel or the holy bagel. And it's this long drawn out. It's like a bagel that's stretched out and it has sesame seeds on it. And I could not understand anything the guy said except mishpoha. Mishpoha. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the only thing I, I was like, yeah, mishpoha, mishpoha. <laughs> But he was Nama's. Nama introduced me to him. When the first time I walked into Jaffa Gate, I was like video calling Nama. And she's like, oh, walk over there and get this bread and, you know, ask him for a day, Fred. And I asked him and he said, okay. And he gave me one price. And she said, no, tell him you're my friend. And I said, um, you, you know Nama? And he looked at me kind of, and I, and I showed him the screen with Nama's face on it. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, for you, don't pay. No, you're not going to pay. <laughs> and then he had this boy bring me tea, like, and he wouldn't let me pay for anything. I was like, no, and he was like, no, mishpocha, mishpocha. <laughs> sweet guy, sweet guy. The first time I saw that word, because I speak Spanish, I thought it read mispocha. 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 <laughs> and when I see the other word, thank you, I see toda, toda, like, like all. Oh. Yeah, oh, so I have to. I have to really focus on pronouncing it. I have the same thing to some degree too, but all the time. And when I was in Israel, a lot of times I wouldn't be able to think of the Hebrew word and I would say the Spanish word, but there's so many Sephardi Jews that that worked. There was actually one time I called, my mother lost her passport while we were there. And I called the, um, the information center. It was at the Mount of Beatitudes that she lost it. Or actually, I think it ended up being Tiberius, but we thought maybe she had lost it there. And so I called there and I was trying to ask them in Hebrew for, you know, my mother left her passport. None of those words are in, you know, the Tanakh. <laughs> no passwords in the Tanakh. So I'm like, uh, and, and, and it's a pasaporte, you know, and, and oh, he knew pasaporte. And he said, oh, habla español. I said, yeah, 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 I speak Spanish. So, so then we, you know, we're talking in Spanish in Israel. And I thought this is so funny. I would have never expected, but then I, that was kind of like my fallback. If they didn't understand my terrible, you know, conversational Hebrew, then I would try in Spanish and that would work <laughs> a lot of times. So, but yeah, that CH, that can be, a, you know, 
it's always a the ch and the kh for the ch because you have cough and cuff. Um, and and a lot of people struggle on that. And, and some people, when they transliterate, they won't use the ch because that you leave the h with a little dot under it. Um, but I like to use the ch and just retrain people because it is it does have that you know it has a different specific sound. Um, so, and it's something to practice. It's some, but it, I tell people, if you can't say het, say het. It's okay. Just like make it an H. Mishpaka. All right. So exciting stuff, guys. Thank you all for yeah. being here, for joining us. Um, I've had a long day, so I'm going to go ahead and close, but I'm going to ask um, our brother Eugene to close us out in prayer, if you're willing. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to say uh, thank you, um, Aja, for getting us introduced to to Hebrew originally. You know, I thought I wanted to learn Hebrew, and I wasn't really quite sure why. And then, next thing we know, we're knee deep in the transcription project, and it's turned into. That's why I need to be here. I need, I, you know, it's. I'm ha I had a great time. It's important to work, but I need to know what the words are because I need to help a little bit deeper and a little bit further. And that's that's why I want to do this, and that's why I'm motivated. It's, you know, it's the most important thing I do, really. It's not what I get paid to do, but it's my, the most important work. And thank you for bringing that to <laughs> you, us and bringing us. You've got, wages stacking up in, you've got wages stacking up in the Alam Haba for this. Don't forget. Okay. Don't that kind of life. <laughs> Abba, Father, we come before you at the close of this meeting. Thank you for the talents that thou hast given us and for Aja's work for this translation course.